Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining today's webinar. The telecommunication industry is evolving rapidly to meet increasing demand for our customers in the next generation computing era. Ensuring robust and reliable network infrastructure has become a paramount to meet this ever-growing connectivity needs. Telecom service providers face the challenges of monitoring the health and network devices and managing the immense volume of metrics they generate. In today's session, we aim to explore how AWS Observability Services can empower telecom providers such as yourself to achieve operational excellence at scale. Hello, my name is Toshal and I'm the worldwide go-to-market lead for AWS Observability Services. I work with our customers across the globe and help them achieve operational excellence using AWS Observability Services. Now, before we go a lot further, let me introduce Greg. Greg? Yeah, thanks to Shaw. So Greg Apple, uh, I'm the worldwide tech leader for cloud operations. So I cover observability uh, with Tashal, but as well as compliance, governance, cloud financial management, and I run a, a community of leader or a community of experts in these areas uh, internally here at, at AWS. Thank you, Greg. Now, before we get started, uh, let's first recognize that there is no such thing as an application that never fails, one that always keeps on running whatever happens. As our AWS CTO, Werner Vogel, often loves to say, everything fails all the time. So we must assume we will need to deal with failures and often exactly when you don't want them to happen. So before we look into what is observability and dive more into the, today's topic of Talco observability, let's first understand how you know your application is performing correctly and that is monitoring more than just the failures. Is your application actually performing as expected even if your application dashboards is all green. Are your customers getting the user experience you want them to give and then they expect? What's the usage of your applications? You likely want to know how many people are signing up if you have a customer facing uh, applications or how many page you are viewed or what part of our applications hitting the limits? Uh, how many time the customers left the uh, shopping cart because uh, they were hitting errors? But most importantly, the business related information, all of this, how it's affecting your revenue and revenue being generated, uh, what geographic regions are being impacted. So monitoring more than just this SLA, the service level object uh, agreement, but you need to focus more on the service level objectives. We assume that most of you know what is observability, but let me just level set here and kind of uh, make everyone on the same page, what is observability and how we see at AWS the observability as well. Uh, observability describe how well you can understand what is happening in a system, often by instrumenting it to collect metrics, logs, and traces. To achieve operational excellence and meet your business objective, you need to understand how your system are performing. Observability effectively give you an effectively way to detect, investigate, and remediate the problem. This can and should improve your operational availability, what we often call mean time to resolution or MTTR. Now, before we go further, let's look at the foundations of observability. Foundation is data which drives your business decisions. What are this data? Again, logs, metrics, and traces, and sometimes uh, there are people a lot of also uh, refer events as a fourth pillar or the fourth part of your critical part of your observability as well. They are equally important, all three of them, or four of them, depend how you look at it. And they are key component of observability. This should help you maintain your SLAs by detecting, investigating, and remitting the problem like we saw in the last slide. So why observability matters? Because your data drives decisions and the real-time data drives the real-time decisions. And we will look at today how you can look at real-time data at scale and quickly detect the problem and meeting your SLOs and in turn improve your customer experience as well as your business revenue impact. Why AWS observability? Again, uh, this is 
we believe that with the, the benefits the AWS bring, uh, we give you a most comprehensive application and infrastructure health. Uh, it allow you to also improve your performance and availability of your applications at the same time to reduce your operational cost. But the most importantly, as we call it, it should improve your end user experience. If everything you're doing, it does not improve your end user experience, then you're not meeting your business SLOs. Now, before I hand over to Greg, uh, this is the last slide. This slide describes our, what we call our full breadth of AWS observability portfolio. AWS observability provide you the end-to-end -end observability, what we call from your inside out or outside in or your end-to-end, -end, so your applications hosted on a cloud or on-prem to all the way to your users who are accessing those applications. AWS services and capability provide the out-of-box observability for not only for your same account, but also across the accounts or what we call cross account observability. So for an example, one of the, the thing about our CloudWatch is it's the zero touch management approach. So you simply enable the CloudWatch, you install the agent and your data will start flowing and you should be able to see them on your dashboard. Additionally, CloudWatch offers curated experience across your containers, your Lambda, and with some of our latest offering with the application monitoring as well as internet monitoring as well. We are also, but we are also making sure that there's a lot of interest in the industry for open source tools like Prometheus and Grafana. So we are also providing services for managed services for those popular tools like Prometheus and Grafana as well. So our end-to-end -end observability helps customer monitor such as yourself, the infrastructure container, the, the cloud services, the underlying resources, but also improve the end user experience. A lot of our app, uh, applications and services like CloudWatch RAM and evidently. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Greg now, who will be taking Great, thanks, us through the rest of this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I'm gonna do quite a bit of a fairly extensive demo here, um, we'll go through a few more slides and we'll go into the demo. But the basis of this demo and what I'm going to talk about is really based off of CloudWatch. You know, Tashal talked about some of these other services. And you could do something, I guess, perhaps similar in, in those. But this um, this approach that we've come up with to help telecommunication in this, uh, the industry in general leverages CloudWatch as, as its foundation. And the unique, you know, CloudWatch is not just for AWS, right? This helps our customers observe and monitor apps in AWS, but also on-prem at the edge, as well as other clouds. So to hold next slide. So I wanna talk a bit about the scope of, of CloudWatch and the scale, because I think scale is really important here, especially when we're talking to te telecommunications companies. They operate at a massive scale as well, and it's important to call out that CloudWatch essentially runs our business. It runs Amazon. Many of the businesses within Amazon leverage CloudWatch for their observability solutions. So we have publicly released stats, and we continue to update them. But the, the latest stat we have here is that we are now ingesting over five exabytes of logs per month into CloudWatch. And Tashal, you just click for the next animation. That's a really large number. That's the equivalent of 50 of these snowmobiles. I'm not, I don't recall exactly which year we drove this on stage. I think it was 2017, uh, but several years ago, we, we debuted the snowmobile, which brings over, I believe it's hundred petabytes uh, per truck into our data centers, into our regions. So we are now ingesting over five exabytes of logs. That's 50 of these every single month, taking logs, basically um, the equivalent of logs to CloudWatch. Even more impressive is how many metrics we're looking at. And to show the next slide. So CloudWatch, and again, these are public stats. Um, we are now, CloudWatch is now monitoring nine quadrillion metrics per month. A quadrillion is a trillion, a uh, thousand trillions. So this is 9,000 trillion. And this is a really hard number to visualize. So when we try to figure out how do we, how do we communicate just how 
how big this number is. So take a dollar bill um, and stack that dollar bill on another dollar bill. Nine quadrillion is going to effectively take you from the earth to the sun and back almost seven times. And we're looking at this, we're making this many metric observations every single month within CloudWatch. So these are massive numbers. CloudWatch runs at a massive scale. It can run our, our business. If it can run our business, it can run your, your business. I want to just start off with talking about the scale that we're operating at, because I think it's really important, especially when we talk about telecommunications workloads. And the other thing, and what we'll dive deeper into this, um, is you know what we found, and I work with a lot of telecommunications companies as well as in other industries, but tel telcos is a high or telecommunications is a high cardinality industry. And I'll, I'll kind of expand on that, but high cardinality is a huge challenge within observability. So to show the next slide. And we actually have a use case, a customer reference. I, I personally worked with, with British uh, Telecom here, BT, uh, several years ago, but they wrote a blog with us uh, that demonstrated how they use CloudWatch to monitor millions of devices. Uh, and you'll see this quote from one of their data engineers talking about how within the first two weeks of operation, the CloudWatch solution alerted their ops teams to a major, major outage within moments of it occurring. They claim that their existing systems, it would have taken much longer. And this new CloudWatch based solution allows them to react faster and put things right sooner. So you can access and read this blog in more detail. This is actually the basis of what I'm going to talk about. You know, BT, like many other telcos, face a high cardinality, um, high cardinality issues when it comes to monitoring their networks. So I'm going to just define high cardinality. And the way I would define this, I think most people would agree, is it's the number of unique values within a data dimension. So if you think about a set of keys and values, the high cardinality is the number of unique values, the intersection basically of those, all the potential values. So I'll just put a graph here or a table. And if you just click one, one click to show. We start with this metric on the right called call drops. This could be another metric. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going with call drops here. We could be measuring latency or jitter um, or failure rate or something else. But let's take the single metric called call drops. And we have four instances of this metric. We also have four dimensions. So the cell ID, the E no B, as well as what I'm calling a region and a market. These are just geographic uh, geographic hierarchy. This uh, demo and this, these slides are tied to um, the Japanese market, um, but you can imagine in the US, for example, you know, we'd have different states within the US, different counties within those states, and then you might break that county down further into different um, parts of a city. So if you look at this table and you look at the singular metric called call drops, we have four dimensions. Those first two columns, those first two dimensions have the potential for high cardinality. E node B and cell ID, there's a lot of potential values there. Maybe the region, the market, not so much. That probably won't lead to high cardinality. But those first two columns are um, you know, very likely to lead to basically a lot of values. Uh, and you know, other examples might be like IP address, um, customer ID. Whenever you have the potential for a lot of values, it leads to high cardinality. So go to the next slide. And this basically creates a huge challenge when you're selecting your observability solution uh, in terms of cost. So we'll take our call drops example. That's our single metric. Let's assume we're operating in a wireless network. We have, let's say, 2.5 million cell IDs. Those are then associated with over about 250,000 e nodes. That's then further distributed over eight different regions. And this, and again, we'll call those states or provinces. And let's say those are then broken down further into, uh, you know, a sub. Um, we we go from a state down to like a county, as an example. So, what is the potential number of metric values here? It's two point five million metric values, and this is important. Even though we only have one metric, there's a potential for two point five million metric values. And now, the way CloudWatch. Uh, is priced and other solutions will do this slightly differently. But generally speaking, when you look at an observability solution, you're gonna pay uh, for the metric values. 
the number of potential metrics that you're creating. So even though we only have one metric here, there's a bunch of different metric values because of this high cardinality dimensions. And so what would this cost in CloudWatch? So just next click. So you, to store base, effectively 2.5 million metrics in CloudWatch, you're looking at about $94,000 a month. Um, this is actually not abnormal if you were to take this number of metrics and look at other ISV solutions, open source solutions, you're generally speaking going to find something very, uh, very similar. The fact of the matter is a lot of metrics just cost money when you're dealing with lots and lots of lots of metrics. And so next slide. And so this basically forces people to make a decision. Can I put all this in metrics? You know, there's a very good reasons why folks want to store metrics. You can do all sorts of statistical um, form. Um, you can run things like percentiles, trim to mean, um, sample count, min, max. There's all sorts of statistical functions that you can apply to your metrics. Metrics are also extremely quick. They're very fast to query. Uh, and they typically will dr drive alarms. And you can do things like anomaly detection very easily on metric type of data. But the fact of the matter is, when you're dealing with millions and millions of potential metrics, you often can't afford to store that data as a metric. And what we often see in the telecommunications industry, but as well as not under, under other industries that have high cardinality, is that you're forced into using logs. You have to go down the route of using logs because it's simply not economical to store this many metrics. Uh, and there's also challenges around, like, how do you actually even visualize that many metrics on a graph? There's only so many pixels on the screen. So we actually have a feature within CloudWatch, and this was fundamental to what uh, British Telecom did within that, that, that blog post that, that reference. It's called Amazon CloudWatch Embedded Metric Format. And it's a bit of a long name, and we're going to explain this in, in further detail. But this gives you the best of both worlds. Right, it, you can use metrics. Actually, if you just go back a slide, Shal, please. So you can use your metrics, you can create aggregated metrics, and then we can store that high fidelity telemetry as a log as well. So you get to keep basically both. You're not forced down this route of just storing all this stuff into logs. That often, when I work with customers that take a log-based approach to their telemetry, it's not uncommon months down the road for their dashboards to take 10, 15 minutes to, to run because you know, logs generally are just slower than metrics. So in CloudWatch Embed Metric Format basically gives you the best of both worlds here. And I'll kind of explain a little bit on how this works and we'll get more into demo here shortly. All right, so just first click to show. So let's pretend we have some telemetry here. Uh, this is coming off a device. This could be, uh, can, you know, customer provided equipment. This could be, uh, cell ID, some sort, just think of a thing that's out in the field in someone's home potentially that is emitting telemetry. So I've color coded some of these key value pairs here. So these first two values, request ID and then server ID, or this could be device ID, these are potentially high cardinality. I'm, I'm going to say they are high cardinality. There's a lot of potential values here. So these are not good candidates for metrics. And again, if you're going down the metric route, you'd have to either make that decision of creating lots and lots of metrics and having to pay for them or not, or losing that data because you're not going to create a dimension based off of that potentially high cardinality. So those first two fields are high cardinality. And the next three fields describe, again, this is a uh, deck was built around the Japanese market, but describe a three level hierarchy, <clears throat> excuse me within the country of Japan. And so these are probably good candidates for, for, uh, for dimensions on metrics. And then we have two metrics here. So we get to our actual metrics. We have jitter and, and packet loss. So imagine we have millions and millions of devices in the field, in people's homes, and they emit these metrics. Now, the way you can use this feature called CloudWatch embedded metric format is you enrich this log with additional information to instruct CloudWatch what to do when it sees this data. So you can see that there's this AWS header in the JSON, and this is simply describing to CloudWatch, when you see this telemetry, these are the steps you need to take. So we ingest all this high, all this telemetry as a log first, it gets ingested into CloudWatch logs, 
and we simply recognize that this header exists and we say, oh, the customer is wanting to create some aggregated metrics. So imagine we have a million devices every five minutes sending this telemetry. What we will then do if you structure your log in this way is we'll take that jitter and that packet loss metrics and we'll create aggregated metrics basically. So for example, you can see here we have four sets of different dimensions. We have a country dimension, we have a region, a market, a region, market, and submarket. So again, tying this back to say to the US, imagine you wanna know what the packet loss is across the, all of the United States for millions and millions of devices you might have deployed in people's homes. This basically embed metric format will ingest this data and it'll basically collect all these millions and millions of samples every five minutes and roll them into this singular metric, this aggregated metric. And so we're gonna basically create a series of metrics here. So we may have millions of devices sending us data. We may only end up with a few, maybe dozens or hundreds of metrics. Next slide. So when you go and take this approach of using a log and structuring it in a way to instruct us to create aggregated metrics, it's really important for you to make a decision on at what point does it not become economical to create more metrics um, or you, there's diminishing returns in the number of metrics you're creating. So this is just an example of a wireline network where this might be where someone might delineate between metrics and logs. So the important point here is we're always going to um, collect and store the logs at the most granular level. The question is at what level are we also creating metrics? So maybe we have a bunch of different sites in our telecommunications network and we create an aggregation, a hierarchy of aggregated metrics at the site level. But as soon as we enter someone's home and we're looking at, for example, telemetry coming from set top boxes or customer provided equipment, at that point, that's gonna probably lead to high kernality. And so at that, we determine we only want to store as a log. So this is a question the business would have to go through if they were to take this approach. Um, what do we store as a metric? Um, and at what point do we stop creating metrics? Because it's simply gonna to lead to high cardinality. To the next slide. And so the way that you can make this work um, is twofold. There's two ways to, to generally do this. There's actually one other way I could talk about. We'll, we'll start with the CloudWatch agent approach. So we do have an agent uh, for CloudWatch. We also have an open telemetry agent. You can use either. And you need to install these on-premise. Um, so you can install those on-premise and we'll actually allow, that agent will enable you to use this embedded metric format feature. So you would send this telemetry from your servers, from your devices on-premise or at the edge. You'd send them into CloudWatch in the next click. And then we would recognize that you've enriched your log with a header that then would create the aggregate metric, which then you can drive alarms off of. Next click. Uh, those alarms often will trigger something. We'll talk more about alarming as well and how we can map your hierarchy to an alarm hierarchy or an alarm tree. But those alarms can also trigger event bridge, which then, you know, during an operational event, you can, for example, have an instant response plan that, that occurs and kicks off. And then you have dashboarding that will look at all this information displayed. Now, we also have Amazon S3 here, because what we often find is CloudWatch all this data is, you know, exists or should exist in CloudWatch for your oper operational use case. But this data, longer term, is also very valuable for analytics and machine learning. So we can stream our logs and metrics directly into S3. And then that can enable you to run, for example, SageMaker models against this data to do longer term analytics and machine learning. Um, so this is not simply an operational use case. We can actually send this data somewhere else to do more analytics. So next slide, or sorry, not next slide, next click. So if you don't want to use the agent, if you're already sending this data to us, um, very often I see telecommunications companies using Kinesis. And so you may already be sending this sort of telemetry uh, to CloudWatch right now. You can also use a Kinesis, Kinesis publisher and send this to data streams. And that's another approach I've seen too. So you're not tied to the CloudWatch agent specifically, um, 
in reality, there's a third way. You can simply call our APIs and just or CLI and just send this data to CloudWatch logs. But these are the two common connectivity options that we see. Uh, someone deploying your CloudWatch agent on premise or at the edge, uh, or leveraging Kinesis to publish this data into AWS. So I'm going to do a demo, I think, and share my screen. So I'm going to go through um, this dashboard, a series of dashboards. We're going to start again, like I said, this is built around the Japanese market. But I'm currently in CloudWatch right now. What I'm going to demo is uh, I have a, basically a simulator simulating thousands and thousands of devices. But that could be millions or tens of millions of devices. And these send, I think, about 10,000 devices sending a bunch of telemetry uh, basically every minute to, to my AWS account here. And so I also have a series of dashboards. And like I said earlier, it's really important when you're using this feature to understand the hierarchy that you want to map these aggregated dimensions to. So let me walk through this dashboard and there's three levels. We'll effectively look at the country of Japan. We're going to go with in uh, what they call prefecture um, or what we would call a province or state in North America called Kanto. And then we're going to dive deeper into Kanto within, and that's where Tokyo is. And we're going to look at different parts of Tokyo, but we have a three level hierarchy that we built it. Uh, into this demo here. And this is our top level dashboard. This is showing us the health of our telco network of our devices across the country of Japan. So I have a visualization here. It's simply a map showing the eight different regions of Japan. You'll see that everything's green. There is one area here that is yellow, and that is the, the Kanto region. You'll see the three is, is mapped to Kanto. And then you will also in, see, and you'll see this throughout these dashboards and as I get more into the data here, four KPIs. So we've determined that these are the four KPIs that we think are important to the business. So we're displaying them on our on our uh, dashboards. So call success, call failure, jitter, and pack loss. And then we have some other metrics here just sh showing the throughput of these different regions. Uh, and then another visualization showing packet loss in a different format here. But this would be a high level dashboard you might put in your knock, something that you're looking at um, your operators are looking at just to kind of give you a sense of how is the whole country doing uh, in terms of our infrastructure that's deployed across here. Again, these KPIs, they look like four metrics, but they're com comprised of thousands, or in this case, about 10,000 distinct values every minute. But in a real world scenario, we're talking uh, millions and millions, uh, basically, of devices. I'm going to actually start that now. I'll kind of indicate, show you basically how that works. So I'm going to go to these four metrics here in CloudWatch, and I'll, I'll kind of just walk through this and why this is so important to create these aggregated metrics. So we'll get rid of call success, call failure, and I'll just take a look at one of these metrics. Let's go ahead and take a look at jitter. So this is our jitter metric. Um, if we go and clone this metric, there is a statistic in CloudWatch. Again, this is why metrics are very powerful. You can apply a bunch of different statistics and CloudWatch provides you with all sorts of ones, high level percentiles, trimmed mean uh, as an example. But if we go and look at sample count and let's just go look at the last hour here. Actually, I'm going to go to a slightly different view. So bear with me one second. We'll do a line view and then I'm going to put the sample count and we'll make that just so it's easier to see purple. Okay, so the on the x axis, we have or, the orange color. This represents our average jitter, which is 18 milliseconds. On the y axis, you see purple, and that's our sample count. So, what you're seeing here is every minute that 18.46 milliseconds is actually an, it's an average of over 10,001 distinct values. So, the, why this is important, we'll get more into the pricing later, but we charge customers. The metric pricing is based off of the number of met potential metric values, not the samples. So this particular metric, you'd only pay one metric here, even though we're sending over 10,000 samples behind that, that singular point on the metric. And so when you have these aggregated dimensions, you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of samples. This allows you to do high level percentiles. So I'm going to actually take and show you an example. So I'm going to clone the average metric again. Now that's green. And then as opposed to using the average, which is a P50, go to a P99. 
And what you're immediately going to see is that the P99 is much higher than the average. So we've gone from you know around 18 milliseconds of jitter. On the average statistic, when we look at the P99, it's actually 80 milliseconds. We can even go further and go down to P99.99. And then again, that would raise that even farther. So this is a very, very powerful pattern within uh, within CloudWatch and most metric based solutions. So let's go back to the top level dashboard. I just do wanna highlight how all these samples are getting stored within CloudWatch. All right, so we're at this high level here. We're looking at a whole country. Uh, we can easily identify there appears to be an issue in Canto region. So the goal of these dashboards, or the goal of these dashboards that you create should be to give you an overview of a 40,000 foot overview of what's going on in your network, but then allow you to drill down extremely quickly and focus on what, what is potentially causing the issue and ignore everything else that seems to be performing just fine. So we're at that 40,000 foot view. We can see one of our particular areas of Japan is having an issue. It's the Kanto region. We also see that there's a, an alarm here. This is showing our alarms. And we can see that a Kanto alarm has breached. So I'm actually gonna go into this and explain how we have these alarms set up. So this is um, what's called a composite alarm. You may find other solutions have something sim a similar concept. But the idea here is that when an alarm goes off, typically speaking, you don't see the, uh, an alarm when you have a customer impacting event, very rarely is it just one alarm going off telling you it's a customer impacting event. There's usually a multitude of alarms going on. Uh, so a composite alarm allows you to basically express in Boolean logic, if these scenarios all happen at the same time, then I actually want to notify my operators. So my Kanto alarm describing is that particular area in Japan in an alarm or not is actually a combination of four different alarms. So I have four child alarms here, all with, for the Kanto region. One's called success again. You, it should be obvious these map to those four KPIs, call success, call failure, jitter, and packet loss. And what we're seeing is jitter and packet loss are in an alarm state. And I define this rule basically with simple Boolean logic. So with ands, ors, nots, uh, parentheses, nested parentheses. And so this alarm is in the alarm state because two of my four alarms are in the alarm state as well. And I've simply said, if any of these go off, then I actually want to page my operator, right? This really helps tremendously with, um, with fatigue, basically uh, alarm fatigue. So I'm gonna go back here and just go back to that top level dashboard we were looking at, bear with me. And so, we have our eight regions, we have eight corresponding alarms. Those eight corresponding alarms are compass alarms and they contain a collection of alarms based off these KPIs. Uh, one other piece I'll actually call out before we move on, I'm gonna go back to the metrics here, is that you can enable machine learning to power these alarms, to make your alarms more intelligent, the thresholding. So if we go back to that packet loss scenario and we look at, let's go give this a different view, a line view, we can actually enable on these metrics. I'm going to go to a P, let's do P99.9. .9. Um, there's nothing really anomalous in this metric, so it might not be the best metric to look at, um, but you can enable anomaly detection on these metrics for this statistic. So I can turn on anomaly detection, and what you will see after I do this, it will actually start to kick in and look at the previous data and learn is something anomalous or not, and why this is important. So this is using machine learning to learn from past behavior. Uh, and then you can use this to drive more intelligent alarms. So this looks like pretty typical behavior. Packet loss seems to be between these percentages. Um, but if we were to see, a, for example, a large spike here at 1500 hours, that would be captured by this anomaly detection and you can drive basically more intelligent alarms. So if I were to go create an alarm here, as opposed to having this set a static threshold, um, I can simply use a dynamic threshold. So static thresholds are can be quite a big pain because you're often managing these static thresholds as they change over time. You can simply use machine learning to detect is this anomalous behavior or not, and you can alarm on does packet loss go outside of our band here, 
or just below or just above, and then you have a number of standard deviations. Uh, so you can widen or narrow that band as well. So we can also enable this as well. So I'll go back, we'll go back to the top level dashboard and let's click down the level. We'll go down into cancel region. So now I'm going to go into the cancel region and then I will pull up how all this actually gets expressed in the metric metrics uh, and, and the logs. So now we've gone down the level. We're now looking at the Kanto area within Japan, which contains seven different um, areas within itself. And what we can see here, we can identify easily that Tokyo, which is number six, is actually incurring or it, its alarm basically has gone off. So we're able to rule out seven of the eight prefectures in Japan. We can isolate it just to one. We can then dive deeper. And then within that particular subregion, we can isolate that the issue is coming from one of seven different subregions. So again, we're going from the 40,000 foot view down very quickly and pinpointing where our issue is. So I have just another, the second level of dashboard. Um, and we can go down even further down into Tokyo and start to uh, understand where exactly is this issue coming from. So now we're at our third level. Again, number of levels doesn't matter. You can define that within the embed metric format and these alarm hierarchies. Um, so you can have two levels, you can have five levels, it doesn't matter. We, For the purpose of this demo, we've simply chosen three. So now we're looking at Tokyo. We've gone from a country to a prefecture down to Tokyo itself. Tokyo has over 22 different or 23 municipalities, but it's this particular region, Sedaga, or sorry, I can't quite pronounce that, um, is the, the problem region here, problem 15. So what we can see here is our jitter and our packet loss. These were some of our core KPIs. Generally speaking, most of these regions of Tokyo are operating somewhere between you know 15 and 20 milliseconds, but this particular area within Tokyo is operating at 172, over 10 times the amount of jitter and basically pack loss in our other regions. So the, now we've been able to basically, you know, imagine we started with 10 million devices emitting metrics, and now we've been able to whittle that down to maybe just 10,000 10, or a few thousand or a few hundred. So the, the point of this is that you don't have to store all this as a log or or a metric. You basically get the best of both worlds. What we've looked at up until this point are just metrics. But the full fidelity of this data is still available as a log. So at this point, it probably doesn't make sense to create a fourth hierarchy, for example, based off the individual devices and people homes. That would simply lead to too much cost from a metric perspective. So all this data is still available basically as a log. I can go into these logs and then actually start to query them. So you can imagine a scenario where you're trying to maybe pinpoint to a particular person's home um, or a particular device in the field. You can get to that level of granularity because we still maintain that basically as a log. And I'll just write a, let me make my screen a bit bigger. I'll just write a, a query to kind of show you that. So bear with me one second. And I'm going to include all the fields here. So this is an example now where I'm going back to the source data uh, and I can say, you know, find me all the, again, remember we have a million, or in this case, in this demo, we have 10,000 devices emitting one of these uh, log entries basically every single minute. So we have 10,000 of one of these. And these are all tied to the individual devices in the field or folks' homes. I can start to dive deep and run my own queries to say, you know, find all the events that occurred within Tokyo where we had a call failure. I'm only going to bring back, I'm limited to the top 10, uh, but we can bring back much more. You'll see here, in fact, over the last three hours, when it goes to query this, there is 1.5, almost 2 million uh, events here, and it queries extremely quickly, uh, basically over this data. So you maintain that full fidelity of that data. Um, you don't lose any of that fidelity. And then you still get a very cost effective basically metric uh, solution on top of this. So you'll see in this case, the way we've structured our hierarchy, we have a bunch of different dimensions. Uh, so I'm going to actually go and look at these and how this actually results in metrics. I've shown you the dashboard that display the metrics, but within CloudWatch, we have this telco dash network namespace. And so as opposed to storing millions and millions of metrics, we simply are storing just go back there, about 1,800 different metrics. So this becomes much more cost effective. So, for example, we can look at Jitter 
off a of particular like at a country level we if we want to look at what's the jitter for the country of japan we can do that but we can also then go further down so we might want to look at a region for example i'm going to just add jitter to my search here so i can look at jitter across those eight regions we can go from a region even further and again we don't need to just limit ourselves to this geographic hierarchy we can include other dimensions you know as long as they're not as long as those dimensions do not have a potential for high cardinality. So, for example, maybe we want to look at the jitter within the Kanto region, which I talked about where we had our problem, and we look, want to look at this across our different vendors um, that we have basically in our network. So, this gives you the flexibility of basically using, getting the best of both worlds when it comes to the metrics and logs. So, to show, I'll go back and let you share the deck again. And I'll just finish this up and we can open this up for Q&A if there's questions. All right, so the key point basically of this demo is the, this hierarchy of aggregate metrics and alarms combined with the high fidelity or the granular logs allows you to go from 40,000 feet to one foot very quickly. And this helps you root cause things more quickly. It helps decrease that mean time to repair. The ability to understand a population of millions and millions of things and then dive down to an individual thing very quickly is a, is a powerful capability. Um, the alarms I showed you, those are powered by machine learning algorithms um, with CloudWatch anomaly detection. Those help predict anomalous behavior. The other thing that's really important, the telecommunication space, but other industries is just the importance of speed in your operations. So I didn't, I talked about how these metrics are coming into CloudWatch every minute. That's pretty typical, but we do support even faster high, what we call high resolution alarms and metrics. So if you were inclined, you could, we would be able to support up to one second metric um, resolution within CloudWatch. And you can use this to drive, the fastest our alarms will be able to go is about 10 seconds. This is extremely quick in the observability solution. And then these alarms that are detecting there's issues within the country, we can then trigger these alarms, again, that we're using machine learning on, and we're creating a hierarchy of alarms or an alarm tree that maps to our business. We can then integrate this into operational tooling, and this really will help reduce alarm fatigue. Next slide. So I put together a bit of a pricing uh, spreadsheet here just to kind of give you an example, like what would all this cost and why, like Greg keeps saying this is very cost effective and I'm trying to prove that basically through through this slide. So I, I put together some um, a spreadsheet basically leveraging um, our pricing, I believe it's in uh, US East 1. And I imagine a scenario where maybe we have 2.5 million devices or cell IDs or something in the field in people's homes. And this dimension is 2.5 million things created 20 metrics. Um, that effectively, if you were to store all that as a metric, you're looking at about 50 million metrics. And the cost to store 50 million metrics in CloudWatch today in US East 1 is approximately a million dollars. Again, that's not terribly expensive when you compare it to other solutions. 50 million metrics is simply a lot of data, a lot of metrics. So this imagine scenario where we actually use this feature I talked about, CloudWatch Embed Metric Format, which gives you the best of both metrics and logs. So we're not gonna go create 50 million metrics. Uh, let's say we maybe create 7,000, 8,000 aggregate metrics. We're only creating metrics at these different points of aggregation within our business. Now we're storing all of this as, also as a log, right? We have to bring this in as a log first, and then we create these aggregate metrics. So 50 million metrics, just rough back of the napkin math, you're probably looking at about 21 terabytes of logs a month. So by moving to the solution where you choose to use metrics for your aggregation, and but you store the high, fi high fidelity data as a log, that would bring a solution that generally would cost around a million dollars a month to about 20,000. Um, and again, there's a lot more discussion that needs to go into this and flushing this out, but this is a high level. I want orders of magnitude want to communicate how cost effective this pattern is. The, the, the pattern of using metrics and logs, not looking at this as an either or uh, situation. 
the next slide. So again, the value proposition here is this solution. Again, British Telecom was a use case reference for us. They published a blog post with us. Um, but the, the value proposition in the, such a solution is that it gives you a multi-vendor view, uh, sorry, a multi-vendor uh, multi view in a single view. It helps you take a multi-network components, present that in a single view, and that will really help speed up fault isolation and inter internal troubleshooting. So you don't have to depend on an observability solution for vendor A and vendor B and vendor C. You can still maintain those tools if you want, but a solution like this will help you consolidate this um, and give you a single view across a heterogeneous set of, of vendors within your network. The scale that CloudWatch operates at, we talked about how many logs we ingest and metrics uh, and the speed that we can ingest these. So this enables near real-time observability very cost effectively with the machine learning behind those alarms and the ability to map a hierarchy of alarms to your business. This helps you drive more actionable insight and react to events. And a solution like this would really help, you know, converge the operations both from your IT and your, and your network. Because there's a lot of features and functionality we didn't talk about. But Tashal hinted at quickly on that slide. We can get into things around real, real user monitoring, synthetic monitoring, application tracing. So CloudWatch can really be that solution that ties all this together. Next slide. Uh, just if you're wondering what did it take to do this with customers, generally the, the most work is going to be getting the source data in, into CloudWatch. So for customers that are already sending this data from their on-premise and engine networks in through the agent or Kinesis, uh, that's usually the hardest part, right? You're deploying agents or mechanisms at scale to collect this outside of AWS and to send it in. So if you once you've done step one, it's a fairly straightforward process. I've worked with a few customers that have implemented this. It takes a few, you know, we're we're measuring this in days and weeks, not weeks and months. Um, so you want to identify those KPIs that are really important for your business. The business hierarchy and those points of aggregation, understanding what you where you want to aggregate, what sort of hierarchy are you trying to map to, that's really, really important. That will drive how you structure all this. Uh, and then you create your alarms and your dashboards, and then you know it's it's really that first step. Once you get past that, the rest of this falls into place pretty quickly. Next step. Uh, Tashal, I'll let you wrap this up. I know you just pitched some of these resources and we can open up for Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. So it, thanks, Greg. That was an excellent demo. Uh, and uh, just, just to wrap up here uh, and even to do that proof of concept, if you don't even know how to even get started, there are multiple resources we have available, right? So we have um, our one observability workshop. Uh, this essentially help you get started with um, any of the AWS observability services, not just the CloudWatch. It is as a step-by-step -step instructions on how you can configure it. Um, and then if you also want to build um, and have your team train on the observability services, we have now uh, observability course available in the skill builder as well. Uh, this is available um, uh, for free right now, and your team can go and take, take the certification as well. Well, we'll open it up for any questions you have, but that's that's all we had for 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 the webinar. Let's see if there are any questions, Greg. Yeah, we'll just give him a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Type your questions uh, in the Q and A. Okay, so there's a question, uh, Greg. Um, what kind of devices can you monitor um, using the solutions, the network devices? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, I don't have the list off the top of my head for the CloudWatch agent. Um, there's a number of operating systems that we support. We do support things at the edge. Um, if you go the Kinesis route for this ingest, uh, you know, Kinesis, you, if you can run code, especially like say Java code somewhere or call CLI, you can get this data in. So I think the only hard requirement is these devices need to have some sort of connectivity um, to AWS. 
I suppose in theory, you could probably do some batching if they were completely cut off. That might limit the effectiveness of the solution because you want to get this data into an observability solution as quickly as possible. But I guess to answer your question, or to answer the questions of Shaul, I haven't run into a use case where you couldn't do this. It's a, it depends on what operating system, what type of device. Yeah. So in, in summary, if you can run the CloudWatch agent or get the data out of your network device, yeah. support any, any network device. It Correct. could be your CPE, it could be your DSLAM, it could be your edge routers, doesn't really matter. Correct. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all we had. Uh, again, reach out to us, reach out to your local AWS representative if you have any questions. Uh, once again, thank you so much for all for joining today's session. Thanks everyone, it was great talking to you.